The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, by the hand of Moses, your servant, you led your people out of slavery and made them free at last. Grant that your church, following the example of your prophet, Martin Luther King, may resist oppression in the name of your love and may strive to secure for all your children the blessed liberty of the gospel of Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I'm going to take the opportunity today to talk to you about one of my heroes, Martin Luther King. Martin Luther King has been a hero of mine in the way he's a hero of Southern lawyers. We just assume that like Atticus Finch, he is to be emulated and held up. But I had an interesting experience when I was actually graduated from law school and was applying for my first job. I was at a firm where I really thought I would fit, and I got into a conversation with the senior partner about Martin Luther King. Now, those of you who've interviewed for jobs know that this was a serious strategic mistake. But I was young, I didn't know any better, and I thought this was a wonderful opportunity to talk about things that mattered to me. Well, the crux of the conversation came down to his claim that Martin Luther King, while a great political strategist and tactician, was not a Christian. Was not a Christian. You heard me right. I was arguing the opposite, of course. I said, well, you know, he did say he was a Christian. And the partner just continued to argue that what he really wanted was civil rights. What he really wanted was freedom for his people. And he would do whatever he needed to do to achieve that end. The obvious constituencies was the church, so he pretended to be a Christian. But if you look at what he did, you will see that actually it was just smart and efficient and efficacious. Nonviolence was just a tool that he used to achieve what he wanted. It didn't have any more significance than that. I immediately withdrew my application from that firm, <laughs> thinking that maybe I would rather not have a job than have to have that conversation ever again. But I, I offer that to you because I don't think it's unusual. It's not always stated so explicitly, but I don't think it's unusual for people to hold up Martin Luther King as an advocate for social justice without regard to his underlying philosophical and theological beliefs. And yet to do so, I would argue, is to miss the presence of God in Martin Luther King and what he did and the people with whom he did it. So I'm going to take this morning and try to persuade you in a couple of different ways that Martin Luther King not only was a Christian, but told us something about the presence of God, which would be helpful for us today in deciding who we are and how we live in deciding who we are and how we live. Now, I can't cover his entire body of work. The man wrote five books, preached a million sermons, and had all kinds of articles, and that's too much for me to survey. And I'm not going to go through the civil rights movement and chronicle all the different events, because that is too much to talk about. I am instead going to select out a couple of moments that I think might be helpful to my point. So, you may have an argument with what I've selected or how I've interpreted it, and that's okay, because I just want you to begin thinking that there's something to Martin Luther King that we should pay more attention to. There's a recent biography out on King, and this is the epigraph at the beginning of it. It's titled just King. It's, uh, it's very thick, but it reads fast, and I recommend it to you. Here is from Genesis. They said to one another, Behold, this dreamer cometh. Let us slay him. Let us see what will become of his dreams. Quickly, a timeline for King. He was born in 29, but his real public career began in the Montgomery bus boycott in 55. By that time, he had gone to college and gotten a PhD in systematic theology. Sometimes we forget about that. He was not just a 
a political leader. He was a, an accomplished academic. He wrote his letter from Birmingham jail, which is one of the more amazing pieces of political thought I've ever read, particularly when you realize that he wrote it on scraps of wax paper with crayons and other rude implements that people were able to smuggle into him. How he remembered Plato and Hegel and all of the other great seminal thinkers is beyond me, but the man was brilliant and educated. We know him often from his famous I Have a Dream speech, which was delivered on the mall in Washington in 1963. And he was, of course, murdered in Memphis in April of 1968, which is why in the church we celebrate his feast day on April the 4th. Why? Because we celebrate the day a saint died. Instead, for reasons I don't understand, we have this holiday here. It was probably open on the calendar. I'm not criticizing that. I'm just saying that's why you may hear about him again in April because we have a different way of going about things. But there is what I would call a romantic narrative about King. And the romantic narrative is basically... He called us to be true to who we already were. There's this ideal of who we as Americans are and the way our society is structured. We have gone astray, and King called us back to our truest ideals. He, and, and what does that mean? That means that our Constitution is fine. Our systemic structures are fine. We need to change the way we're implementing them. We need to include all within them, but the basic way we're organized is fine. This is a claim made by Brandon Terry, who's a professor in Harvard, and he edited a collection of essays called To Shape a New World. His effort was simply to put forth the political philosophy of King and make the case that King is a first-rate philosopher, though long since forgotten by the academy because he wrote and spoke and acted for the people and not just for the technical academicians and therefore is not covered. Usually if you see a compendium of philosophical writings, you might get a letter from a Birmingham jail, but you won't get his sermons. You won't get his five books. And I think his being a Christian has something to do with that. But for the moment, just know that what Terry claims, and he's not alone, is that King has been cast in the, as the protagonist of a romantic story. Everything is good. We just lost our way. We need to go back and clean it up. Despite streets being named after him all across the country, even Reagan created this holiday, and we often have days of service in honor of Martin Luther King, days of service. But, Terry claims, there, why as true as that is, it's not all of the story. He also challenged us to think about ourselves in a new way. He challenged us to think about ourselves in a new way. What new way was that? Well, King is not naive. And he didn't believe that we're, everything's going to be fine. We just need to make this minor adjustment. He believed that we are always going to be called as people to confront evil. That's the human predicament and we're not going to get out of it. But he also believed that nonviolence, and he defined it as direct action, was the only force. He didn't choose it just because it was helpful in the moment. He didn't choose it just because it seemed to work. In fact, for the majority of it, it didn't seem to work at all. He chose it, I think, because he believed it was the only force, the only force that wouldn't unleash a backlash, a further chain of bitterness, and revenge and retaliation. In other words, he's, just not, he's not just trying to secure rights, he's trying to change who we are. He's not just engaged in collective action, he cares about how we as individuals are affected and changed and transformed by that action. These are very theological commitments. And so in that challenge, I think he challenges us to think a new way about what it means to be nonviolent, what happens to the individual engaged in the social action and what it means to see the promised land, to see the promised land. I want to offer a theological comment that is not in Brandon Terry's book. In fact, I haven't seen it anywhere associated with King, so feel free to reject it right away. 
But I want you to think about it because I think it does apply to us today. And that is, there, think of the image of a house that's perfectly constructed. And then over time, of course, it requires maintenance. And that maintenance invariably gets deferred. And maybe it breaks down a little bit. And it needs painting. And the systems end their useful life and have to be restored or replaced. But fundamentally, the house is fine. And then our job as owners of that house is simply to keep it up. I think that's a metaphor for how we often think about history, and particularly in this country, and maybe the world. It's also a theological claim. It's like saying Eden was fine. Everything was fine in the Garden of Eden, and then we ate the apple, and that was the problem that caused all of this other stuff to go wrong, and we just have to get back to the garden. We just have to overcome the consequences of the sin of eating the apple. And I want to argue that is looking backwards. And while it may have some truth to it, doesn't deserve the value we've placed on it. Instead, I would offer you another metaphor, the metaphor of the garden. You plant a garden and it begins to grow, often in unanticipated ways. You need to fertilize it. You need to water it. You need to prune it. You need to take care of it. But it is going to surprise you. And you're going to have to learn to live with it not just take care of it. But can you ever imagine looking at a garden five years in and say, gosh, I wanna go back to the way it was on day one? No, because you know the whole purpose of the garden is to grow and your whole purpose as the gardener is to facilitate, nurture and participate in that growth. And I wanna argue that's a more theologically helpful way to see the world. You might call it evolutionary theology. That is to say, God created the world and the world is growing and in the world is a consciousness that is also growing. And so as we get more and more mature, we are able to see more and more of God's work in the world and act as co-creators with God more effectively in it. Now, I believe that we in the church wrestle with these two paradigms all the time. Why, I've asked before, did Jesus come? Did Jesus come because we have this sin and only Jesus can pay the price of that sin, but ultimately we want to go back to the way it was? Or did Jesus come to reveal the presence of an active God who is always with us, which will carry us forward to a future that we can never even imagine? I argue, I have in the past, I will again, that the promise of God as specified in the Hebrew scriptures and picked up by Jesus is the latter. It's like looking at the world as a garden that continues to grow and change in unexpected ways, not the former. Like all we have to do is get rid of the bad stuff and it's all fine already there. And so while there are many thinkers who believe that we have whitewashed King by turning him into a hero, by having service projects that clean up the park, but not worrying about whether we ought to put nonviolence into our way of being, you know how it goes. The farther we elevate somebody, the less we have to actually pay attention to them, right? There are philosophers arguing that has happened. Maybe, but it seems to me that you can look at these two metaphors and see us choosing the familiar one of King was really restoring something that was fine, not the more challenging one, which was King as a Christian was telling us about a God who's active in the world, guiding us in how to be in order to enable a future that we couldn't imagine. That's my fundamental claim. Let's look at it in terms of these three things. What does it mean to be nonviolent? Well, King, of course, was close with Gandhi, as were other, or at least Gandhi's thought, as were others in the civil rights movement. And what's interesting to me is if you look at Gandhi and you look at some of the, the writings of King, particularly when talking to uh, some of the uh, Malcolm X and others in the Black Power movement who were using violence as a tool for liberation, sometimes we think of King as being fundamentally passive. Nonviolent means never reacting, being passive. And I want to argue that's not at all what it means. It means acting aggressively in a way that leaves out violence. 
So Gandhi said, if you can't practice nonviolence, then retaliation or resistance unto death is second best. He's not saying lay down and take it. He's saying we're trying to build a better world, but I would rather you fight and be violent than do nothing. See that? Is that what you thought about nonviolence? It's aggressive, it requires creativity, and as King said, it requires direct action. Cowardice is impotence, worse than violence. This is from Gandhi. King adds, you do have a right in another debate he was having about how they ought to go about this as a public debate. He is arguing that you have a right to self-defense. Everybody accepts that. It's part of every moral theory that's ever been articulated to his claim. The question is how you sustain a successful challenge to structural injustice. And I would argue this very issue is being <laughs> debated right now when we think about Hamas and the Palestinians and, the, and, the, and Israel. Where Does violence have a role in that? Do you have a right to violence if you're subject to systematic injustice? That's not... That, con that situation is too complex to diagnose with a simple principle, but it does raise that issue. And it certainly came up with the Black Lives Matter protest where people were saying very explicitly, we've got a right to violence because that's the only way we can overthrow this systematic oppression, right? Those are conversations that weren't lodged back in the civil rights movement. They're being played out today over and over again all across the world. I'm arguing this to say, I think this is relevant but what King is saying is it's not just about securing this freedom right here. It's about creating a new world. It's not just about going back to that perfectly formed house and letting more people in the front door. It's about tending the garden and coming up with a new way of being a new place in which to live. Key to that thought is King's idea that the end, you know, this means and distinction, the end are prefigured in any means. The end is prefigured in any means. Gandhi says that the, I love this analogy actually. Gandhi says, think about acquiring a piece of property. There are a lot of ways you can get that land, let's say. You could steal it. You could buy it. You could kill somebody to get it. You could have it given to you as a gift. You can apply this to your home. Think about how you're, you got your home. Did you buy it? Was it given to you? The way you acquired it affects the thing itself. It affects the meaning that it has for you and what it is. This is what Gandhi is saying. If you steal a piece of land, that's not the same thing as having it given to you, right? If you killed somebody to get it, that's not the same as acquiring it. So the means you use to get that land affects that land and its meaning to you and its value and, in fact, who you are. And I think King picks up on that. He says, King does, how you get it transforms what it is. Does that make sense? Because this is a key point, I think, to understand and understanding King's political philosophy and, in fact, his theology. So this is a picture from 2016. This woman lives in Scranton. Pennsylvania. She's a single mother. She went to Baton Rouge, Louisiana after the shooting of um, a man, a black man, who was completely uh, immobilized and then shot in the chest at close range. It was a horrible moment. I don't want to go back to debating what happened there. I want you to hold on to your own sense of that. So this woman, having seen other people arrested it was a completely peaceful demonstration, nevertheless walks out into the street because she said she wanted to tell her son that she had fought for his rights. So she walks out into the street. She's confronted by these two uh, police officers in full riot gear. And I don't know that if you can see it, but there's a crack in the pavement. Can you see that crack that runs right between them and over to the side? as if to say they're on different planes of existence, almost. They look to me anxious and awkward, and I suspect do not want to be there at that moment. She, on the other hand, is almost looking past them as if it's not about them, really. Do you see that? 
What else do you see in this picture? Her hands are open. Her feet are grounded. She's committed, isn't she? Yeah. The power of one, nice. Right. Surrender, vulnerability, yeah. Bravery. And powerful, right? Powerful. But don't you also just get the sense that like something is horribly wrong? (laughs) Like whatever happened, whatever the larger structural things are that happened, like something is horribly wrong when we get to this point. I just, I'm overwhelmed by that awareness. I'm, I believe in systems, as most of you know. So, you know, there are all these systems that yield us to moments like this, but something is horribly wrong. So, nonviolence. It's direct action, and the way you engage in it has a lot to do with what it causes and brings about. Okay? You can't look at that scene, I don't think, and not be convicted that something has gone wrong. All right, second thing. Let's think about what happens to the dignity and respect of the person taking the action. We've spent some time in this class talking about our baptismal covenant and our commitment every time a child is baptized or a certain feast day occurs that we will strive to respect the dignity of every human being. I've argued that striving means continuing, right? As if it's a way of life, a way of being. That respect is in its Latin etymology, looking again, looking again. Not a status that somebody has or you owe them, but the active uh, behavior of looking again. As if to say, I'm going to keep looking at you until I see the presence of God, right? That's who I'm going to be. That's how I'm going to live. I'm going to respect the dignity of every human being, no matter how covered it may seem at the time. And this was a key part of King's thought. I think in many ways, the most difficult to accept. Of course, when he's talking to the people for whom the movement was launched, he's saying, you need to defend your dignity and your self-respect against humiliation. You are, he used to say powerfully, somebody. You are somebody. And you have a somebody-ness. Dignity was, is this term we use, but he, he talked in terms of being somebody and giving the sense of being somebody, allowing you to stand up and feel your power as a human being. But this character that I want you to recover, don't degrade it. Don't degrade it. Don't be humiliated and don't degrade your character by humiliating other people. This is, I think, a very hard ethical precept to follow. And just when you get home, pick two or three newspapers and see if you don't agree with me, right? There's not a lot that I read in our political debates about honoring the dignity of the other side, whatever side you're on. We, the church, don't have to be that way, right? But what King is saying is there are two sides to this. And if you're ever turned away from the good, he said, and he means that in a Christian sense, you'll corrode your soul and take you farther away from flourishing. So this is his basic anthropology, right? And so he's saying nonviolence is the way to proceed because anything else destroys our souls. Anything else destroys our souls, a very Christian commitment. I mean, again, I just want you to pause for a minute and think about somebody that, public figure perhaps, that you think seems to have the sole purpose of persuading you to resent somebody else. Don't raise your hand, just get that person in your mind. 
some public figure who seems to have this as their purpose to persuade you to resent somebody else. Got somebody? Don't raise your hand. Is that person somebody you agree with, you don't agree with? Somebody from the other side? Somebody who angers you by their very presence? If so, do the exercise again and pick somebody with whom you agree with. Somebody you think is articulating the truth. Somebody you think is advocating for your views and, and, and dispositions that you agree with. If you're honest, it probably won't take you very long. If it does, do it at brunch. Think through this person on your team who seems to have as their purpose, their strategy, their tactic to persuade you to resent the person on the other side. Right? King was against that. King said that corrodes your soul. King didn't feel that way about any of the people that were tormenting him from Bull Connor right on down the line, a position that many of his peers couldn't accept. And frankly, I can't do it. I'm sure you can do it. But it's hard. But you see what King is he's telling us to do, to engage in nonviolence, to respect the dignity of another human being, is to change, literally transform who we are and how we look at other people. And yet that is the critique that King is offering in this whole movement. It's not just securing rights of freedom and escaping the oppression, wrongful and persistent and long-lived though it has been, it is becoming a new creation, a religious commitment. All right, King refuses to hate the people that are persecuting him. When he dies, even his adversaries are saying, we miss him. He was adding something. He never reconciled with Malcolm X. Too much had happened, he said, for that to happen. And yet it was clear that he was missed, even without the reconciliation occurring. He refuses to humiliate other people, to diminish their status in front of people for his own pleasure or even to subject them to standards of behavior that they don't adopt for themselves. He practices forgiveness as a way of life, a religious commitment. Because he doesn't just want freedom from this oppression that exists today, he wants us to be transformed into new creations. And he says, in his last book, I think, which are some Canadian lectures that are published, he says, you know, to do otherwise is not rational. It's not rational to resent, to have your, your definition of victory be vanquishing your opponent, right? If your definition of victory is vanquishing your opponent, it's very difficult to have anything on the other side. Where's the relationship on the other side? How are you ever going to enter into it? How can there ever be the more perfect union if you vanquished half of those who are supposed to be in relationship with you. So what King is looking for is we don't get to the other side. And to get to the other side requires us to act in a certain way because if we don't, the other side won't be available to us. Now, what do you see in this picture? Anything different? <laughs> <laughs> it does, doesn't it? Yeah. Tired of looking at it? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, she goes to jail. And this picture goes viral. But, but what, I, what I want you to see is, given King's view, do you look at the scene differently than before you thought about King's view? You know, we often, um, we find what we're looking for. We find what we're looking for. It's the way our brains function. So are we looking at a scene looking for violence and abuses of power, or do we look at a scene looking at potential for relationship or a way to get to the other side? 
that fundamental spiritual disposition will, I think, have a lot to say about what we see and therefore how we behave. All right. Finally, I want to go to that third point that I've chosen. Look at what King means when he talks about the promised land. You remember those soaring rhetoric of the I have a dream speech, which is one of the most brilliant. I wrote a paper in seminary about this speech. We just studied some uh, stage method of, you know, kind of cataloging people's personalities and ability to understand things. And I used that method to analyze the speech. And what I concluded is that King, intentionally or otherwise, spoke to each and every stage in this development model. He's quoting Plato and philosophers at one level, and he's talking about a blank check in another. His brilliance is in taking what he was saying and making it available to absolutely everybody that was at the mall. But when he talks about the promised land, I've seen the promised land, he says, remember? And he doesn't, he says, I may not get there. And it's pretty clear in the rest of his writings, he didn't think he was going to get there. And yet he says, I've seen it. What does he mean? It's often interpreted, I would say overwhelmingly, as having said, I've seen the end of racial segregation. Or a more Christian inflection, I've seen heaven. as if he's had a glimpse of the future. But what if he means something else? We don't know, he's not here, so I get to speculate all I want. What if he means that he, in the politics and social life that has been part of the movement, has seen the promised land? The promised land is a union politics in Memphis, the garbage sanitation worker strike. It's student gatherings in Mississippi during the Freedom Summer. It's people walking 350 miles, three days to Montgomery. It's the beloved community. What if he's talking about something tangible and real that he's been living in the middle of and not simply an abstract glimpse of something he's seen out of the future? What if that is what he's talking about? So I'm going to show you another scene on the mall in Washington, and I just want you to watch it. It's short. And see if you, what you can, what, um, what can you see in this video that would suggest that this is the promised land that Martin Luther King has seen, that this present on the mall is the promised land that he's talking about.
What did you see? Joyful. Yeah. Rear view mirror. Despite what I said, they were doing it anyway. Yeah. What else? And what in that made you think about that? Just a feeling that, yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Cer certainly if you, if you um, like think just about that gathering, right? So the racial makeup, the seeming joy that they were taking and helping each other do something for a larger purpose that seemed to encompass them all. Would that be fair? Yeah. What else did you see? Right. Right, yeah, our principles coming alive. And who's been to church? Who's going to 1115? Going to 1115 service, because I hate to spoil the sermon. But, but, but so Sam's talking about Jesus in the sermon. And, and I would say our principles in that sense are like Jesus who is alive, right? Not Jesus, a historical person. We usually think about the spirit. It's easier for me, but however you phrase it. Right? There's a spirit of life and togetherness and community that is there that does not diminish the individual. You didn't get the sense that any of those individuals thought they'd lost their personality. And yet together they were more than they would have been by themselves. Maybe the truth is not something any individual held, but something the community has to arrive at. Yes. Hope. Right, hopeful is, and can, can you say more about hope? What is hope in that sense? Something better will happen, yeah. Mm-hmm. Right, and so I'm kind of subtly, or maybe not so subtly arguing that maybe that hope was grounded, rooted, to keep up with my metaphor here, rooted in their relationships with each other, their experience of community. You know, we often talk about the church as having as its purpose, I often talk about the church as having as its purpose, the creation of an alternate community that witnesses to God's presence in the world. So it's not that we persuade the world to change. It's not that we force the world to change. It's that we live in a way that's attractive to the world, that people want, right? So we're worrying about things. This is a conversation Mindy and I were having. We're worried about things that maybe the rest of the world isn't worried about, who we are. That's what King is saying. I think that's the province of the church. What else did you see in the community that's emerging there? Yeah, 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 yeah. Of course, what King is saying is, I want you to be able to make that statement with no until. It's hard. Yeah, yeah, thank you. What else did you see in that clip? And maybe you didn't see anything, maybe it just made you feel a certain way, right? Yeah. Purpose and intention. 
Yeah, they're kids. I love the kids being there. And um, how about the foot washing in the pool, right? I'm thinking, there you go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right, right. If not actually a, a presence of it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Robert, did I hear your voice? Oh, so what Melody said is it feels like it's really close to the kingdom of heaven that we talk about all the time. It made manifest to put words in your mouth which is exactly what I think King was talking about in his speech. Like I have seen these people, some of whom came from far away to participate in the movement. And remember how violent the movement was in many places. But I've seen these people gather together for the betterment of all. And I've seen them mature. King uses a lot of language about immaturity and maturity that we don't pick up on so much today. I tend to think of that as a growth of consciousness, but nevertheless, he talks about maturity. We have matured as a people, and as we mature the presence of God, we are more available to it, and we recognize its existence more readily, which I think is what Melody is saying. She just didn't have to use all those words. And it's similar to the kingdom of God that we experience as a community here at Vancouver. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think at our, at our best, there's a sense of you walk in and there's a community here and you're accepted and brought into that community and it's about something beyond this community at our best. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Yeah, the symbolism is pretty powerful. I will just say personally, because, you know, um, my dad went to Virginia Theological Seminary in Alexandria. So, uh, and when I was a young kid, I spent a lot of time in Washington. And back then, you could go to Easter egg rolls on the White House lawn and do all kinds of things you can't do now. But my image of God over time has moved from, the, if, once you go inside the Lincoln Memorial, do you, you know what that site is? That big, huge figure with those massive hands. <laughs> my goodness, it's intimidating. That was my image of God when I was a child. It's like, you know, all good, all powerful and coming after you. That was what I thought about God. <laughs> it's like how I thought I could hide from God's a whole another conversation. But my image of God over time, I realize in preparing for today has, has moved from that somewhat abstract depiction of the past to the people that are in the mall and specifically the relationships that they had fashioned and were committing themselves to, which is kind of where I'm trying to lead you to think about, right? So just a very different way to think about God's presence, not embodied in the power or even the ideological purity or courage of that statue, but instead in the willingness to live their lives for each other that you can see in the crowd. The who? Oh, Lincoln's eyes. Thank you. Yeah. Well, from, you know, when I was, I, I didn't know there were eyes up there, but I, I'm willing to acknowledge that. Yeah, that makes good sense. Um, so we talk a lot about the beloved community, and I just want to say, as I already have, that I think the purpose of the beloved community, and I would argue church, is to reveal an alternative way of perceiving and living life. We don't have a mission. We are a mission. We don't have a mission. We are a mission. That's why I don't like mission statements for churches. They're fine for other organizations. Our mission is to be a Christ-centered community. Our mission is to love each other and be present to each other in a way that reveals Christ's presence and God's presence to the rest of the world. We can participate in this mission, if you will, by being a sign of and witness to the yet-to-be-actualized new reality. 
God is in the future. God is the beautiful garden that becomes. God is not the perfect house that we are restoring. Right? And I think King, while he doesn't express it that way, is arguing for exactly that through nonviolence, through an attention to who we are. This is called deontological ethics. We tend not to think of deontological ethics today. Who am I if I do this thing? Right? We tend to think of consequential ethics, like does it work? This was evident to me in our torture debates. Remember about waterboarding and all that? Was there any conversation really about who we are for doing this? It was mostly about does it work or not? The arguments pro and con were about does it work? I'm not presaging the answer. I'm just saying the whole idea of deontological ethics has really been, in my view, lost from our public conversation after King. And yet it's clear that was a big part of what he was about. And it is a big part of what Christians are about. So I want to leave you with another thought. But before I do, any other comments? Okay. Okay. Mindy. Um, so going back to when you said uh, Reagan created the Department of Education, was that it? In 83, I think. I have no idea, but I'm willing to accept that. I will, I will also, but I'll... I'll... Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. Okay. I'm going to give Reagan some credit, whether you like it or not, but I hear you. But I also want to say um, that if you read a lot about King, what you find is that Coretta Scott King is a much more powerful figure than we know her to be and influenced him in really powerful ways that we don't always know about. So, David, you had your hand up, I think. Right, so, so forgiveness being critical to his survival and prosperity and thriving, yes, and I think the moment of that is when he's sitting at his kitchen table after the bombing, I think, of the house. Help me out here. But he sits at his kitchen table and he just, and God says, you know, keep going. So yeah, I think that's right. All right there were a number of other hands, so don't let me miss you. Um, I promised to do it next time. It came from a, a philosopher that King kind of adopted, but I think we think of it as being part of the civil rights movement. Well, I've got to go to church, and, and many of you have to either get your kids from Godly Play or go to church as well. But what I want to say when we think about nonviolence is, and we hopefully I persuaded you that King's arguing for a way of being, how should we think about his philosophy of nonviolence in our government institutions, in those institutions that actually have power. You with me? We tend to think about it as a strategy, a preferred strategy for those who are powerless. But what happens if we were to adopt that as a guiding principle for those of us who have power? Not just individuals, but governments, militaries, intelligence services, the whole thing. What would it mean to be a community where the powerful were guided by the principles of nonviolence, not just the powerless? I think if King were here, he would want us to ask that question. I, thankfully, am not going to answer it today. <laughs> Go in peace, love, and serve the Lord.